each one of you as we begin this, the third in the series of Caribbean public consultations with regard to the Regional Conference on Higher Education being sponsored by various governments, participants, stakeholders, institutions throughout Latin America and the Caribbean, the government of Brazil as a main sponsor and UNESCO ESL, the International Institute of Higher Education for Latin America and the Caribbean. This series of consultations is in keeping with the need to hear the voices of the various stakeholders throughout Latin America and the Caribbean. And essentially today, Thursday, November 30, we hold this, the third in our series on the theme, internationalizing Caribbean higher education, recognition, mobility, and investment. This comes under the broad heading of the future of oh, higher education is, uh, is Caribbean. Before we proceed though, I would like to indicate to all persons that we do have available interpretation. If you go to the bottom right hand corner of your screens, you will see those three dots. When you click on them, you will have options created, including interpretation. Once you click on interpretation, then you will receive interpretation in either English or Spanish as required. So we want to acknowledge then ESAUC's contribution throughout Latin America and the Caribbean with respect to the higher education agenda. ESAC has worked diligently in contributing to the success of the World Higher Education Conference last year, contributing a number of reports that were launched, including financing higher education, international aid for higher education, supporting women's participation in higher education in Eastern Africa. ESAC has spearheaded and is leading efforts for countries throughout the region to ratify the Buenos Aires Convention on Recognition. It came into force having been ratified by member states, Cuba, Grenada, Peru, Uruguay, and later the Holy See. The presidency is currently occupied by Uruguay with the vice presidency occupied by Grenada. UNESCO ESALC has worked on important matters such as the impact of COVID-19 on the higher education system throughout the region, digital transformation, assessing digital maturity, contributing to the SDGs with particular focus on SDG 5, gender equality, and focus on how universities are performing. The universal right to higher education has also been on the agenda and with the support of the Open Society Foundation gender equity, and gender-based violence in higher education. We have made a sterling contribution to the GEM report concerning technology in education, and have been focused on capacity development so that the higher education system throughout the region may be transformed with a particular emphasis on the quest for sustainability. At the World Higher Education Conference last year, May 2022 in Barcelona, Spain, under the theme Beyond Limits, New Ways to Reinvent Higher Education, conversation took place and it was driven by two significant timeframes, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, and the new social contract proposed by the Futures of Education Initiative towards 2050. Higher education is faced by an evolving global landscape. There are new and interconnected global threats, climate change, the loss of biodiversity, persistence of armed conflict, inequality, and challenges to democracy. Within higher education itself, we continue to see expansion. However, the challenge is enduring disparities. Internationalization is significant. Technologies are playing an increasingly central role and we see multiple approaches to funding. We want to acknowledge that there are some principles that guide higher education within this global framework. Inclusion, equity, diversity, academic freedom, 
critical thinking and creativity, the need for cooperation to assure excellence, sustainability, and social responsibility. The need for integrity and ethics is uppermost in our minds. So what we have done through the World Higher Education Conference and within this roadmap is to redefine the traditional um, legs on which higher education is founded. And so the, looking at it through these principles, we see the need for us to create and define a global citizenship that is able to comprehensively and sustainably address the complexities of modern life and the global landscape as it is evolving, bearing in mind the challenges enunciated earlier. A focus on shared knowledge and open science through transdisciplinary approaches. And then with respect to the traditional idea of service, social engagement and ethical responsibility. So we see six major transitions afoot from exclusion to inclusion the right to higher education. Higher education is focused and arranged around critical disciplines. However, we do see and appreciate the need for holistic learning. We speak about and we acknowledge the silos that are embedded and form part of the infrastructure and the framework for higher education. How can we emerge out of these silos and to move towards transdisciplinarity, a terminal approach to a lifelong learning model? a hierarchical model, one size fits all, to a flexible and diversity-based model. And finally, we acknowledge that the higher education model as it currently exists is content-based, but how can we see this as be more transformative? That is to say, acknowledging the various intelligences, the, 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 the creativity that is out there, are, are forming and allowing space for the diversity of learning, the diversity of knowledge, and as it ushers from the bottom, the base, all the way up to the top, and that interaction and the integration of the various perspectives. So we do have a timeline towards 2032, when it is hoped that the fourth World Higher Education Conference will be held. Within that context, as we meet today in this consultation series, we talk, we speak, we are engaged in dialogue as we prepare for the Caribbean's contribution to the Regional Conference on Higher Education, which will be held in Brazil, March 13 to 15, 2024. A preparatory meeting was held in March of this year in Cordoba, Argentina, and it approved the constitution of working groups for 12 thematic areas. We meet today on the thematic period 12.2, the future of higher education in the Caribbean. These working groups have the triple objective of taking stock of achievements and pending challenges, promoting a regional consensus on the priorities for the development of higher education in the region in the next five years, drafting a basic document on the corresponding axis to help guide and enrich the discussions during CREAS plus five, and a final declaration. And so I want to acknowledge this at this time as given and providing this background to our conversation today. In order to advance the conversation, I would like to introduce Dana Lazarus McQuilking, who is the Vice President of the Regional Network on Recognition. And we invite her to speak to the whole issue of the Buenos Aires Convention and the, its benefits, if it is that the Caribbean advances its ratification through the member states. Dana, welcome. I invite you now to take the floor. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Damian. I will now share my screen. It's currently raining in Grenada. So if you hear that, that's some good old rain in the background. Okay, so as Damian said, I am excited to speak with you this morning on implementing the new regional convention on higher education. I will also refer to this as the Buenos Aires Convention from time to time. The hope with this presentation is to 
break barriers and build sustainable bridges. All right, so before we go any further, I want to ask you a few questions just for reflection. So what do you know about the Buenos Aires, or like I said before, the new regional convention? Do you believe in regional integration? And if you do, what does that look like to you? And finally, do you understand the benefits that can come from regional integration? So please think about this as we move into the presentation. The convention impacts three types of mobility, academic mobility, student mobility, and by extension, labor mobility. Think for me for a moment about your own migratory experiences and the impacts those have had on you. Now, was this experience transformational? You were no doubt taken out of your comfort zone to be exposed to things that you may otherwise not have been exposed to had you remained in your own country. This exposure most likely caused you to develop transversal, transversal skills and emotional intelligence, possibly resulting in positive attitudinal changes self-efficiency and critical thinking, creating the confidence for you to seek out and or accept opportunities for improvement. Now, be that in collaborations for research, opportunities for work in your area of expertise, or even improvement in academic performance. With these new opportunities, openness, and probably a shift in mindset, you began to feel even more prepared to take on the global job market. Does this speak to any of you and your experiences? Now, I began with the individual because when one is empowered through education and access to resources and opportunities, they can become drivers of economic growth and development within their societies. And for the purpose of this presentation, within their own region. But this doesn't look so great for our region in this area. If you take a look at this slide, you'll see that globally, academic mobility increased from four to five million within five years. But for the regional growth, this was much smaller, moving from 258,000 to 312 students, recorded as the second region in the world with the lowest mobility. Now, just in 2019, out of 312,000 students who left a country in Latin America and the Caribbean to study abroad, only 120,000 opted to study in another country within the region. This means, colleagues, that over 50% of those students chose countries outside of Latin America and the Caribbean for their education. The region registers as one of the least attractive for higher education studies. So much so that students within the region chose North America or Western Europe for their education. Would you agree with me that this requires a solution? So let's get into the meat of the matter. Historically, many students and academicians have traveled across borders for academic purposes. So much so that governments began to see the benefits of investing in higher education to bolster their economies. However, some argued that the higher education institutions did not produce graduates who possessed the relevant skills to fill positions within an evolving job market, one that was characterized by globalization and technological advancements. So in an effort to prove that their courses had practical elements that aligned with the said job market, higher education providers and programs began to increase and diversify, giving rise therefore to, internationalize, to the internationalization of higher education. Sometimes that word is so difficult to say. Um, but this added to the already intricate higher education landscape, especially in respect to the recognition of qualifications. So in response to this, UNESCO began to actively advocate for regional agreements spanning the six regions of the globe, as well as ad adopting a global convention. The first of these regional conventions is what concerns us today. And this is the, the 
agreement on, sorry, the agreement for the recognition of studies, degrees, and diplomas in higher education in Latin America and the Caribbean. It was adopted in Mexico in 1974. The objective was to ensure the acknowledgement of foreign higher education credentials, thereby facilitating the flow of knowledge and, ta and talent, promoting economic and social development. Ironically, even though we were the first to adopt this agreement, we are now lagging behind in the rate of mobility as well as in ratifications. So because of the, because of the changes in the higher education landscape, the conventions were revised to align with the current landscape. The revisions and the adaptations gave rise to the second generations of conventions and were based on the seven trends that you see on your screen. This process produced the Buenos Aires Convention of 2019. It is critical to point out at this time that Grenada is the only English speaking Caribbean country to have ratified while Jamaica is the only English speaking country to have signed on. This begs the question, what about representation from other neighboring islands? Also, how will our voices be heard and particular needs be met effectively if we do not have ample representation? Now in 2023, states parties to the Buenos Aires Convention assembled in Colonial de Sacramento this is in Uruguay, to chart the way forward to achieving SDG 4.3 by promoting cooperation and quality in higher education. Three regional working groups were formed by the member states, the coordination group, the capacity building group, and the public policy group. These groups aim to develop guidelines, training sessions, and policies for recognizing higher education studies, diplomas, and degrees including those of displaced persons. So you might ask, how does this convention benefit my country? Well, it means that state parties will benefit from a harmonized framework for recognizing qualifications across multiple countries, streamlining the process for students, academics, and professionals seeking educational opportunities or employment in neighboring nations. As a result, individuals can pursue their academic and career aspirations with greater ease and efficiency, fostering trust, a culture of mobility, and lifelong learning. Now, as you may well know, I am speaking to you from Grenada and we are a small trial and state, which measures just about 132 square miles. I am not going to go into our story, but you know that we have ratified the convention and we have made many steps uh, in trying to implement the principles of the agreement. So these are some of our, well, the three main institutions that offer higher education programs in our country the T.A. Marshall Community College, the St. George's University, and the University of the West Indies Global Campus. All right, so I will just skip through Grenada's story because I don't think we have the time for that today. And you will, you will hear a lot more about Grenada story and how we look at internationalizing how we look at internationalization uh, later on in the webinar. But colleagues, I think that the time for action is no. So we ask you to seize this opportunity to transform the landscape of higher education in our region, because by ratifying this convention as a region we not only make a strong statement to the global community about our position on education and our commitment to SDG 4, but we demonstrate our unwavering commitment to the betterment of our societies, the empowerment of our citizens, and the advancement of, us, of our nations and our regions. And so before I close, I take this opportunity on behalf of the organizing committee 
to extend an invitation to you to attend the regional convention, to attend the regional conference, I'm sorry, on higher education in Brasilia from March 13 to 15, 2024. Now, leading up to the conference until January 24, we will continue to have these series of public consultations. And we urge you to lend your voice to this conversation as this is an opportunity for you to be, for this part of the region, sorry, to share your experiences and our particularities and to have a more impactful presence and voice on regional matters of higher education. Thank you. Thank you, Dana. We do appreciate your remarks and your contribution to this conversation. As noted, Dana is the vice president for the regional network on the implementation of the regional convention. And so we do appreciate your sentiments and particularly the perspective from which you speak. You also are an officer with the Grenada National Accreditation Board, and thus you are able to bring an, that contribution from the perspective of Grenada to the overall conversation, and this is appreciated. As we therefore proceed now in the conversation concerning internationalization and within the Caribbean education space, we want to acknowledge the overall background which is located within UNESCO ESALC's continuing efforts to stimulate the commitment across Latin America and Caribbean to a regional perspective, to regional integration, and being able to discuss as colleagues across language, geographical, gender, and the various issues that create our diversity and distinctions. And we want to encourage, certainly within the Caribbean, particularly within the English speaking Caribbean, a, an understanding of UNESCO ESL, its work and its contribution and the extent to which we should participate so as to make our voices heard and thus influence and influence significantly what obtains at the regional level. So thank you, Dana. It is now my pleasure to introduce um, Norda Seymour Hall, who is Director of International Relations of the Jamaica Church for Education Commission, who will moderate the rest of the morning's conversation and she'll present a brief opening remark and present each presenter by way of a brief introduction prior to their contributions. Mrs. Seymour Hall, over to you. Welcome and good morning. Unmute. You are muted, Ms. Hall. Unmute. Good morning. Thank you so much, Dr. Black. As we continue to look at internationalizing Caribbean higher education, recognition, mobility, investment, we are very pleased to have our panelists with us this morning. Uh, PVC Sandra Maynard of the UWE Global Campus. We also have Mr. Shane McQuilkin from Grenada and Mr. Franklin Bennett, Michael University College in Jamaica. And you'll hear a little more about them later. Now, internationalization of higher education is a current buzzword in higher education. And we, we often hear about it, and it means different things to different people. It is the intentional process of integrating an international, intercultural, or global dimension into the purpose, the functions, and the delivery of post-secondary education in order to enhance the quality of education and research for all students as well as staff. And of course, it is a way of ensuring that all stakeholders within the higher education institution can make a meaningful contribution to society. When we think of the term, we think of many different things. We'll think about academic mobility. We'll think about forming international partnerships, engaging in various projects, as well as ensuring that we have international academic programs. International research initiatives are also a very important part of internationalization. It encourages the universities to establish branches in various countries, as well as to ensure that they can engage in various learning modalities. Internationalization facilitates inclusion at the international, intercultural, as well as the global level. 
and there are various benefits to be derived. In addition to knowledge translation and acquisition, mobilization of talent, as well as enrichment of the curriculum, we know that internationalization, as was stated earlier, engenders international cooperation and solidarity. It is also a way of energizing a nation's economy and ensuring that there is democratizing of administration of universities of college. It also broadens, broadens academic freedom and facilitates new approaches to a range of issues and problems that we encounter in our Caribbean societies. Within the global north, it is, it tends to be that there is more focus on student recruitment and mobility. Whereas in the global south, including the Caribbean, we tend to focus more on developing partnerships to reduce risks, as well as increasing competitiveness, enhancing knowledge and increasing our capacity for research. And of course, our global south continues to struggle with replicating and creating infrastructural capacities that are already established in the global north. And so today, we're going to be looking at some of the issues that are facing our higher education sector, and we'll be hearing from the representatives themselves. And the goal of this discussion is to stimulate the appreciation for the benefits that are to be derived from internationalization, as well as helping us to understand what are the bases for successful internationalization. We'll be sharing internationalization strategies for higher education, and we'll also be exploring solutions to issues that arise from our ever evolving global um, landscape. Our first panelist this morning will be our Pro Vice Chancellor uh, for the University of the West Indies Global Campus, Ms. Sandra Maynard. And I'll briefly introduce her. Sandra Maynard, the Pro Vice Chancellor for the Global Affairs, the Global Affairs Division of the University of the West Indies. She was appointed and became effective in January of this year. She leads the global engagement portfolio and coordinates all internationalization and strategic global initiatives across the UE system. She gave oversights to the progression of the new UE global campus. She leverages the high reputation of the regional university to build capacity and generate revenue as a core part of the university's financial future. She has considerable experience in international student recruitment in China and elsewhere. She also serves as a critical part of Coventry's university's global agenda. She was also a project leader in setting up the UWIC Coventry Institute for Industry Academic Partnership. She is a qualified barrister at law. She has so many experiences in so many countries, but she's a native of the Caribbean, born in St. Kitts and Nevis, and now living in Jamaica. Welcome, PVC Maynard. We're looking forward to your presentation. Thank you so much. Um, and um, uh, quite an introduction. Thank you very much. And uh, I send greetings to everyone who's joined us um, on uh, this uh, particular and symposium. This is um, uh, just to just to clarify, and I just wanted to explain, because I know that the University of West Indies um, has um, a, a complex infrastructure that uh, some of you may be aware of and others may not. So I will just um, attempt for now to summarize. So the University of West Indies, as um, it's known, it's number one within um, our region and it currently has five campuses. Now, the campuses are based, uh, the um, first campus uh, started back uh, back in 1948 here. Um, as the Mona campus and um, we then have the Cave Hill uh, campus in Barbados, we have the St Augustine's in Trinidad and Tobago, we have our uh, newest um, landed campus as we call it in Antigua and it's called Five Islands and then we also have the global campus which I know that Dana mentioned um, that we have and that provides um, the online capacity uh, for education uh, within the region to those who wish to study 
in a virtual environment um, or do not wish to actually attend on the landed campuses. Now, this is a really interesting uh, topic area. My background and, and, and history within um, this particular um, area has been with previous universities driving forward um, their international partnerships um, across the world. Now, you can tell probably from the English accent that um, in those circumstances, I have had the um, privilege of working within the UK, and I certainly know that there were various resources available uh, to me um, to ensure that those partnerships, that engagement, both for staff and students, um, were allowed to be very successful. Now, I just wanted to clarify one matter. Um, as Pro Vice Chancellor of Global Affairs, I actually sit in the office of the Vice Chancellor. So I effectively am the Vice Chancellor's arm um, for when it comes to global affairs and global matters. Now, traditionally, um, the rationale for internationalization um, began um, with the UE some time ago. And it initially started with its enhancing of its international profile and reputation, and it pushed forward with improving the quality of the qualifications that it offered um, in making sure that there were certain partnerships that they would enter into. And of course, we have the accreditation bodies that operate within the various subject disciplines. Now, of course, it wanted to create strate strategic allegiances at various areas around the world. But more recently, uh, and I say uh, previous to my coming here, um, the UE really has pushed forward and emphasised the importance of comprehensive internationalisation. So it, want, uh, it certainly looks at embedding um, international perspectives in all aspects of its missions and activities. And it also wants to sort of shape the ethos of the institution to make sure that it can respond um, effectively to challenges, particularly for those that happen externally. I mean, the largest challenge that I think most of higher education um, institutions faced was, of course, uh, COVID-19, which then forced um, many of um, institutions to actually close their doors. Uh, UE wasn't one of those, thankfully. Um, and it was able to migrate face-to-face um, -face teaching to an online modality. Now, just to give you historically, and I know we've, I know that um, uh, Dana mentioned, um, or oh, forgive me, it wasn't Dana, my apologies. Um, it was in fact, uh, Norda had mentioned that it was, the internationalization is a kind of a buzzword that is going on at the moment. But I can say that the UE back in 2006, um, in the Chancellor's report, um, called for the establishment of a university-wide international office to drive the internationalization strategy. And subsequently, that became part of the University of West Indies strategic plan. And that started back in 2007 to 2012, and then it continued, and it still continues until today. As a result of that, in 2016, the Vice Chancellor created this office um, because it was significantly important to ensure that internationalization touched every aspect. It wasn't just simply from an academic perspective. And therefore, part of my office's uh, remit is not just about partnerships. Um, so for example, we have 10 university uh, centers um, and institutes, and they are strategically positioned around the world. So, if we, for example, we have those in our African continent, we have in Europe, um, the UK, and the United States. So we have many of those, and I know that I've only got 13 minutes, so I'm very cognizant of the fact that I'd love to tell you all about those particular institutes, but those that if you wish to see, you can see um, online. But just looking at um, internationalization, it all starts from the basics, doesn't it? Which is the importance of education in higher um, education institutions. And ultimately, I'm not going to reiterate what's already been said, but we know that it's important to acquire knowledge, skills and values um, within our future generations. And it is crucial for us 
um, within Jamaica, within this region, and of course within Latin America, um, to the development of each country to make sure that we can provide and develop a skilled workforce um, within our own region. Now, what does internationalization actually bring to education? Now, there's lots and lots of um, scholars have written about this, and many of them have talked about that creating a well-educated and skilled workforce, and that in itself then leads to foreign investment, and of course, the aim of creating that um, skilled workforce is to ensure that those individuals can then um, hopefully um, achieve and access better paying jobs. Now, exposing our students and our staff members to an international experience, obviously, it helps from a cultural perspective because it's a two way street. So we have that. Um, cultural exchange. So from my perspective, it certainly looks as though it helps and it's hoping to achieve that element of social cohesion um, so that people have a better understanding um, from each other's perspectives. Now, what it also should hopefully lead to is a, um, a more diverse and globally minded workforce. Um, now, that can obviously benefit businesses, organisations that operate internationally. And certainly from, from here in, um, in Jamaica, it will certainly benefit the experiences from an international perspective within our education is going to benefit um, development of business and infrastructure within uh, Jamaica. Now, back, interestingly, back in 2008, um, an educator, Jane Knight, try to define internationalization and um, this was part of an article called higher education in turmoil the changing world of internationalization interestingly and she defines it as the process of integrating and international intercultural or global dimension into the purpose functions and delivery of post-secondary education now, that definition became the foundation of how institutions began to understand um, internationalization. But you'll note from the date of that, certainly that the UE had um, put in place mechanisms because it realized that it was a need um, with respect to regional development. Now, we currently have a number of methods um, when it comes to internationalization. They include, for example, distance learning. And one of the aspects that has proved to uh, be very successful is the global campus. And the global campus, of course, provides both um, undergraduate and postgraduate um, qualifications uh, to their learners. And it allows them to learn from anywhere they wish within the region and, of course, within the rest of the world. And the university certainly is poised to develop and push this even further. There is the recognition that um, higher education is important when it comes to looking at the sustainable development goals. And, and part of that has driven our current uh, Vice Chancellor, uh, Professor Sir Hilary Beckles, to put in place and create the International School for Development Justice. And that, as it will come out in time to come, will push forward with um, graduate courses in relation to um, all of the SDGs, including the one that is most fitting for this um, area, which is sustainability in uh, quality education under SDG 4. Now, providing that online, um, you may ask, does this actually really give you an international experience? Well, of course, we're hoping to create an environment or a community online that will encourage that kind of interactivity, and it will allow then for internationalization to um, continue, and certainly cultural appreciation to continue um, in an online space. 
But ultimately, uh, the bulk of, if I say this, our uh, students are the ones that are going to be studying for undergraduate. And the key aspect of, of that is, what does internationalization bring for them? I think it's been ex exposed in many forms uh, previously. But from a region, it certainly um, concerns and troubles me in, in this way. And we talk about the brain drain. And arguably, uh, Judith Knight had said it was the brain gain, interestingly. The brain gain is not something that the region really has benefited, benefited from in the same way um, as we talked about it, that the global north has benefited from the brain gain. We've actually had um, the brain drain that has occurred across our regions. And as it was quite helpfully mentioned by Diana um, earlier in her um, delivery, the statistics show that many of our students feel that there is value in going to the global north to have um, their education or higher education, particularly graduate education. Um, and then often what we do is we then lose them. And we lose them to those countries, and it's not a criticism in the fact in any other way other than they go to study, they get offered employment, often that employment is um, higher paid, and then of course we come back, they create families, they set up a life, and then they tend to only visit. So internationalization um, certainly looking at uh, or from um, the UE's perspective is to try and get the students to have that international experience within their during their study rather than simply taking an opportunity at the end of their degree to leave uh, the region now the difficulty with that is is that we have many other facilities to try and help with um, student mobility and staff mobility and many of the times we are very reliant upon uh, grant funding from various um, institutions uh, across the world or non-governmental institutions I should qualify that with and uh, the other ones are things for example like the Erasmus plus um, programs the challenge is our isolation is that we are here in the, the global south and traveling to have that international experience often becomes very challenging and is financially um, difficult to achieve. Now, what do we do about that? And within the space of um, the global south, we certainly would want to have that kind of integration, but of course there is that language barrier. Um, so what we have done here, certainly at the University of West Indies, and again the Vice Chancellor has indicated that all students coming from an undergraduate um, qualification should be competent in a second language. So we have taken steps to ensure that we are preparing our students for that international um, experience so that they can remain, if I say this, within the global south and to benefit in that way. Now, there are many advantages as we've um, already looked at. Um, for example, we've got the integration of technology, um, which can enhance our um, internationalization strategies. And of course, the mention um, that Norda mentioned earlier around international partnerships. Um, we also have joint international uh, um, graduate programs and what we should really be looking at is looking at how we can integrate even um, deeper or even more deeply our undergraduate um, joint qualifications. Now there are a few that do exist but I certainly know from my experience um, in the UK that this was something that the um, international community were crying out uh, for. But there are challenges in achieving that um, and very, very complex mapping um, and accreditation bodies and so forth to bypass. Now, I just wanted to take a look, um, not that I'm being negative about this, but the disadvantages um, within the systems of higher education and the internationalization of this. Now, if we consider 
um, our actual higher education systems. Um, it's, they're very colonial in infrastructure. And um, Hans de Witt um, mentioned uh, in 2019, he said, many of the elite from each country in the region have been trained in higher education systems of these colonial powers. And one can still observe an outward mobility trend to these colonial states and dependence on their funding, teaching and learning, structures and cultures and their quality assurance processes. So does this cause a problem? And I ask the question and I ask this so that we can think about um, our um, infrastructures, our teaching, our learning. Do we need to look at decolonization when it comes to our um, qualifications? Now, when we look at this um, creation of the elite, we call this, as we say, the brain drain. And I think that that's a term that everyone's quite familiar with, um, certainly within the, the region. And um, even though at inception of this concept around internationalization, it was considered as the brain gain, um, I am concerned that particularly um, within the Caribbean region, certainly, um, that we are not benefiting in the same way from the brain gain. Also, looking at internationalization, um, sort of 25 years ago, who could have imagined, for example, um, that um, international student mobility, for example, would become big business? And also aligned to the recruitment of brains for other nations' agendas rather than actually building or helping to build the region and certainly here in Jamaica its own human capacity and we've seen this with the exodus of a lot of our medical staff nurses particularly and also our teachers so I raise this at this point and I know that um, many of you will be familiar with the fact that uh, a lot of a lot of um, students finishing their qualifications will say yes great let's go out into the world and they get offered um, many um, opportunities from agents who will say we'll recruit you to the UK we'll recruit you to parts of Europe we'll recruit you to the United States of America and a lot of the times they are tempted by that um, and I ask myself the question, if we were to help build in to their undergraduate qualification a good substantial international experience, would that help to reduce the brain drain? But it also raises other issues about how do we finance that? And I know that we here in the Global South are not in that position as many of the universities in the Global North are in to be able to finance um, semester abroad programs, for example, or even summer camps or any other international activities. So I'm going to wrap it up now because I'm conscious of time and I don't know, you should indicate Nordi if I'm going over. Whilst I agree that internationalization empowers staff, students and institutions um, and various sharing of knowledge from those institutions abroad, um, it certainly um, can help to mould our students um, and the hope is with that integration we want to ensure that that's trying to eliminate um, cultural biases and try to create and mould uh, globally and socially conscious uh, young people moving forward. But I know that with the university here, we've got close to 50,000 students um, as part of the University of the West Indies. And I would love to say that we could be able to give each and every one of them an international experience. And I appreciate that there are methods in which we can do that. And I know that colleagues have been working incredibly hard to achieve that. But one thing that I would say that looking at um, the experiences is that many of the international students that do come over here, which is about 1% that come into the region um, generally, um, they are coming in, but again, they're coming in for the experience and returning back 
to their own um, homes. So ultimately, it can be a wonderful um, aspect to enhancing that for many very different reasons that outlined uh, by other speakers and also um, I outlined at the start of, of my talk. But I just wanted um, to raise a couple of questions, which is how do we actually address the core issue in retaining our academic elites so that we can develop um, and grow our own economies? So thank you very much. And I look forward to any questions that you may wish to ask. Thank you very much, PVC Maynard. We are going to save the questions until all the panelists have presented, and then we'll have a wonderful discussion looking at some of the issues. You've raised some issues that we really need to contemplate as we move forward. Thank you so much for your presentation. And My so pleasure. we're going to we're going to move now. Uh, we're going to move along now to our second presenter. And our second presenter uh, is coming to us out of uh, Grenada, Mr. Shane McQuilkin. And he and he is an experienced educator. He has worked in education for over 20 years across the various levels most recently within the field of quality assurance, accreditation, and accreditation. His formal training and qualifications include a bachelor's degree in the pedagogy of foreign languages from the University of the West Indies and a master's degree in tourism, hospitality, and catering management. And he's currently completing a postgraduate diploma in quality assurance in higher education with the University of Mauritius. He has made several international presentations and several regional presentations. He's currently working as a technical administrator at the Grenada Medical and Dental Council Accredi Accreditation Secretariat. And he has many interesting perspectives that other Caribbean islands can learn from. So we welcome Mr. Shane McQuilkin as he presents to us from Grenada. Thank you so much for joining. Over to you, Mr. McQuilkin. Yes, good morning. Let me just share my screen a bit. Okay, give me one sec. Hopefully you're seeing my screen. Okay. Yes, we are. Great. So good, good day, everybody. I'm not sure about time zones. Um, I think the introduction has already um, said who I am. I am really grateful to UNESCO ISAC for the opportunity to share some perspectives today on the topic of internationalization of medical education in, in the Caribbean. I think Nada set it up very nicely um, in her intro, in her salvo, as well as um, the very contemplative issues raised by PVC um, Maynard. So I, I am going to take a, a different um, direction. I, I have what I consider to be a, a very visual um, illustration of, of the issues that, that surround um, medical education in the Caribbean and specifically uh, the case of my island, um, Grenada. So I want to start off um, with some definitions. Nada did a great job at that, but I want us to focus on some of the recurring words. And, and these are words like integration and intercultural and global dimensions, um, integration. And, and, and it has to be, as Nada alluded to earlier, a deliberate attempt um, by the institution to infuse that into um, the experience of the, of the students so that they can become globally competent um, citizens. And some key aspects of um, internationalization of education include, um, as you see, curriculum, student mobility, um, international students and faculty, partnerships, collaborations, et cetera. So I, I wanted to add some context because I am aware that we have a number of Latin American um, colleagues with us this morning. 
So I wanted to add some context, some quick um, data on the Caribbean population. So overall, we're about 47 million. Um, in terms of the island states, we're about 44. But those of us who speak English, we're only about 7 million. And Grenada has a, a whopping 120,000. I say whopping jokingly, um, citizens, uh, inhabitants in total. I wanted to give you a perspective on medical education in the Caribbean. So you would notice that spread right across the Caribbean in almost every territory, there's at least one medical school. Some of them are international schools. Some people say offshore, it's international medical programs. Some of them are regional, and we'll get into that a little bit later. So as we move, I want you to keep in mind the words intercultural, multicultural, integration, all those aspects that we spoke about before. So the birth of these international schools in the Caribbean region really began in earnest in the 1970s, where um, you had five new international medical schools being established. And since then, um, there has not been a decade when at least two new schools have not um, joined the foray and, and established themselves offering medical education programs. So what I just have here um, uh, on the left, you have the international schools. On the right, you have the regional schools, um, primarily those from Cuba and um, PVC Maynard's institution, UWE, and all the medical campuses and so as well as University of Guyana. Now, one thing you would notice is that the international schools all offer an MD degree, but these English speaking schools offer the MBBS because it's, these schools follow the British model and their degree is a dual degree, bachelor's of medicine, bachelor's of surgery. Of course, it doesn't give me the opportunity today to get into much details, so, I'm just going to go through and any question you can ask at the end. Um, now we have what we call the big five in terms of medical schools across the Caribbean. And that big five is, is premised upon the number of graduates that the school has churned out. Um, these are the schools who normally have better match rates, residency match rates, um, better scores in the step exams and so. And again, we have to consider that these international schools all follow the American model. So the goal is to get an education and generally because the population of students are primarily from North America to go back to North America to practice. So we also have to keep that in mind. Now, because accreditation is a big deal and that's where I, I, I work every day and none of these graduates would be able to obtain a license in the US if the schools that they attended were not accredited. And so in the Caribbean region um, for medical education, we have three agencies, CAMHP, which was constituted by CARICOM, which regional heads of states. And, and because of that, um, they do the lion's share of medical schools in the Caribbean. Um, they do all the regionals and quite a bit of the international schools as well. More recently, you have ACCM, um, and they're becoming more popular in the Caribbean in terms of accrediting medical schools. And then there's the organization which I represent, the Grenada Medical and Dental Council. Um, we are also legally constituted by our government, Grenada, to accredit medical programs in Grenada. And I'll say a little bit about that a little later on. In terms of a common thread you see here, you'd notice that they're all recognized by the World Federation for Medical Education, and that has serious implications, which I will again visit later. So here we just have a, a snapshot of the international schools and, and their accreditors. Um, you have CAMHP, as I said, being the dominant force. Um, you also have SABA, and you'd notice that SABA has a unique accreditation agency. And that is because Saba is still a, a Dutch territory and as such, they're accredited by an agency from that um, jurisdiction. And then you have St. George's University accredited by us, the GMDC. So I wanted to zero in on the case of Grenada a little bit. Um, 
So we're just about 133 square miles, like I said before, just about 120,000 inhabitants. Our primary language is English. And at present, in country, we have one MD program. A bit more on us. Um, we, that's the Grenada Medical and Dental Council, like I said, responsible for all medical education programs in Grenada. Um, we have comparability status with the NCFMA, that's the Department of Education, that's an arm, sorry, of the United States Department of Education. And through, through comparability, what happens is that medical education is an expensive business and comparability affords the students um, in Grenada that attend SGU to access Title IV federal loans to finance um, their education. So this is crucial as, as we say predominantly the student body in terms of numbers um, come from North America. We're also recognized by the World Federation for Medical Education and, and that is also crucial um, because it means that any school that we accredit, um, the graduates from that school does have the opportunity once they meet the criteria to practice in the, in the USA. And we also believe it important to engage our colleagues and so in the field um, in terms of quality assurance, in terms of medical quality assurance and so. And so we align ourselves with different groups. Um, namely here I have Kankit and Nkwahe um, so that we can keep the conversation going. We really aim to be a world-class organization. And so we believe in collaboration, we believe in discussion, we believe in networking, and we believe in benchmarking. And so we utilize these memberships and these engagements to do just that. So I just wanted to show you um, very quickly um, St. George's University um, School of Medicine. It's a pretty vast campus um, because it is um, American owned. I, I don't think they suffer from some of the issues that our own regional um, institutions may have in terms of um, financing and infrastructure and so I, I really hope some of my colleagues from um, Latin America would see this picture and want to jump a plane to visit Grenada that would be great um, but yes um, on a, another note I just wanted to give you a program overview so the school has two basic science campuses um, one here in True Blue Grenada and another in Northumbria England um, however, the campus in Northumbria, England, you can only do the first year of medicine there and then you still would have to come to Grenada to do the second year of the basic science training. The school is, is vast in its operation. Um, so there are about 80 or so affiliated clinical sites where students rotate um, and do their, their, their clock ship rotations and so. Uh, and these sites are located in, here in Grenada, the majority are in the US and then you have some in the UK as well. The school takes in students um, three times per year and it's a typical to the American system. It's a four year degree with two years of basic science training and two years of clerkship rotations. Very importantly, in terms of the, the conversation of internationalization, the school has several partnerships and collaborations with universities that form pathways to, to medical school. And I just wanted to give some highlights um, about the school that, that speaks to, again, the, 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 the aspects that we spoke about earlier in terms of the internationalization, in terms of the intercultural integration, and all these other, other words that we spoke about. So the school started in 77, 1977, with 54 MD students. Already the diversity began there because there were UK students, US students, Canadian students, Grenadian students starting there. For me, one of the, 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 the highlights of the school, one of the most important or amazing things for me is that at present, for example, there are students from about 113 countries represented at the med school. Now, when we think about 
interculturalism and multiculturalism and diversity and shared experiences and, and honing um, skills based on experiences from all over. And so it really does speak to that aspect of internationalization in terms of the students coming in um, and all working towards that common goal in terms of becoming a medical doctor, but having so many diverse experiences, backgrounds and contexts um, that can be modeled or melded into one um, to make a better doctor at the end of the day. Um, so, so far from the beginning, there were about 301 Grenadian citizens who graduated with an MD degree. It may seem a little bit, but in the context of our population size, um, it is quite an achievement. However, I must say that the point raised by PVC Maynard does um, resonate here because many of these Grenadian graduates have left us and are now practicing abroad. In terms of graduates since the inception, uh, the school has graduated just over 22,000. And of those 22,000, approximately just about under 12,000 are currently enrolled or practicing in the US. And the school, surprisingly, when I say surprisingly, I, I, I'll, I'll contextualize that, they're the largest provider of doctors into first year residencies for the last nine years. And that is not just outside of the US. That is not just in schools outside of the US. That is also in schools on the mainland. So both US schools and non-US medical schools, St. George's University provides the most um, first year residencies. And I just wanted to run through some graphics. So as I said before, um, the North American students form the bulk of the student population. However, there's representation from all across the globe, including um, Latin America. And this here depicts by country um, the, the students that are represented at the school. It's really, uh, it's really uh, immense. It's, 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 it's a real big, diverse um, population of students. And I believe that that augurs well for internationalization in, in many ways. In terms of the spread of countries, there are about 31 Asian countries represented at the school, 29 African countries, almost the entire Caribbean, um, 18 European countries. And we do have about um, eight countries in Latin America. I believe I missed one. In terms of the faculty, that is quite diverse as well. Faculty comes from 35 different countries. Um, and it also speaks to them bringing their own experiences, um, their own case studies, their own context, and um, their own appreciation of the, the, the way to teach the curriculum and so. And so I just wanted to conclude, make some conclusions, uh, to say that in some ways, international medical schools in the Caribbean have really fostered and sustained internationalization of, of education. Um, the diversity of student and faculty population engenders really strong multi and intercultural ties and so experiences and relationships. It, it, allows, it allows the student, the graduate, to have the option of practicing internationally. And that has several implications in terms of family ties, in terms of um, persons back in your home country realizing that this is a possibility and trying to emulate. Um, it, it really does have several implications that you can, if you so choose, practice internationally and, of course, get recognized as an MD um, in the USA. Foreign students, of course, will develop affinities for Caribbean states, and that has major economic spin-offs. I, I listened to uh, PVC Maynard speaking about how students typically leave our island, and I remember Dana as well, speaking about how most of our students tend to go to the, um, the global north to study. And, and uniquely enough, this is almost a, a complete contradiction. Um, in that I, I just term it reverse osmosis in education, where these students from the US, the North, um, come down 
to the Caribbean to gain an education and return as a professional uh, generally to the to the island of of birth to the country of birth so yes the, the spin offs are great in terms of the tourism in grenada and we're big on that here in terms of healthcare in terms of funding and so many more things and of course there's a greater appreciation of international cultural and social context we we cannot um undervalue the importance of this because what we're speaking about here are medical doctors. And at any point in time during your practice, you may have to deal with a multiplicity of ethnic groups and so. And so I believe that that integration and that because you're so used to dealing with everybody, it will reduce any sort of cultural biases, prejudices, and so that that people may have. So I believe that this is key. Um, and that is gained, of course, by the experiences shared from both your peers, international peers, and the faculty. There are several more conclusions that can be drawn. There are a lot more aspects to internationalization that can be spoken about. But I'll stop here today. And if there are any questions later, I am willing to entertain. So thank you very much for the time. Thank you so much, Shane. Wow, what a presentation. We learned so much um, about what's happening in Grenada. And no doubt, I know that the representatives of the other islands will be keen on some of the issues that, that were raised. And we look forward to the discussion later. Uh, so we are going to continue. Um, we are going to be hearing now from Mr. Franklin Bennett. And he is the principal lecturer in the office of the president, he's in charge of collaborations and partnerships at the Michael University College. He's presently principal lecturer in the Faculty of Education, and he has served as a director for its School of Continuing Studies from 2008 to 2022. As principal lecturer, Mr. Bennett is also responsible for collaborations and partnerships. He has developed competencies in curriculum and program planning, as well as impl implementation and evaluation, project management, and other external relations. He has been serving on several committees charged with institutional capacity building, external collaboration, and outreach services. We want to welcome at this moment Mr. Franklin Bennett, He's from the Micro University College in Jamaica. Mr. Bennett, welcome. Thank you. Just checking, are you hearing me clearly? Yes, we're hearing you loud and clear. Okay. Will you allow me to share my screen? Well, you're not able to do so. Oh, you're uh -huh. able to share, Mr. Bennett. Go ahead. Okay. Okay, you can put it on slideshow. Okay, is that, is that clear? Quite clear, you may go ahead. All right, good day, my brothers and sisters. I'm so privileged to be among a set of, did I say elites, or persons who will make me feel as if I'm wearing a crown. Well, thank you for the opportunity to take you into the micro space so that we can get a sense of how do we operationalize all that we have been talking about in the context of internationalization of, I'm going to say, tertiary education. So let's go. So my presentation is entitled The Michael University College Collaboration and Partnership Realities. And we are going to be very real this morning. Now, in order for us to do anything regarding internationalization of what we do at Michael, we have to have some mindsets. And these are in keeping with 
what we have been hearing from our very first speaker in terms of what we may understand collaborations and partnership to mean. And we are realizing that these involve initiatives or arrangement of various kinds between two or more organizations working to accomplish specific goals in distance education that have, inter that have rather institutional commitment. And we have borrowed that from MARIT from 2006. Also, collaborative partnerships. Yes, we know that these are agreements and actions made by consenting organizations. And I'm stressing consenting to share resources to accomplish a mutual goal. And I'm stressing mutual because later on, I'm going to play on those. These agreements rely on participation by at least two parties. We have had experiences where, yes, well, there's two, and one of the partners want to bring in a third because that party has partnership with the other person. So those things can happen, that configuration. But well, these parties will agree to share resources. And in terms of resources, we are thinking of finances, knowledge, and people. Okay. These concepts, we think about them in the context of external relations. And to us at Michael, external relations will involve local as well, well as regional and international. So the process of identifying and maintaining a healthy interaction with outside stakeholders. And who are these? People whom our operations closely or remotely impact, or whose operations closely or remotely impact ours. So reciprocation is hinted from the very beginning in terms of how we look at external relations. Now, internationalization of higher education is in keeping with what we have heard so far, and it is embraced by the thinking of UNESCO and its affiliates. So we are seeing that it is intentional, it is integrating, it is international, it is intercultural or global. Who are involved? Staff and students. Okay. And what's the output? there should be some meaningful contribution to society and society in which these institutions involving the partnership reside. All right, the micro, I termed it 1836. And maybe I'm copying how the gleaner is referring to itself. But Michael began in that year, and it began with a deliberate purpose because it came out of the Michael charity in England, and its core business ought to be teacher education. So that's a challenge because if Michael thinks of doing other things that will make teacher education its second focus, then we may have to reconsider a new name because the thrust and the charity that oversees Michael, really we have to focus on teacher education. So we know that it's the oldest institution, tertiary institution in the Western Hemisphere. Our core business is teacher education. We have transitioned 
into what I call a pathway between college and university that we call university college. And because of that, we can offer bachelor's degrees and master's degrees, even doctoral degrees under our scheme of arrangement that is entitled, which is an act of parliament gazetted in 2006. So legally giving Michael the mandate to offer degrees. We are non-denominational in terms of our Christian faith and we are co-educational. And the profile of our graduates, we have some things that we use to talk about them. They ought to be critical thinkers, problem solvers, and they should be equipped to have an impact on any space that that graduate chooses to reside. Now, our genesis when it comes to external relations. So we're going to hear about the when, the where, and the why. When did all of this begin? So our name is now the Michael University College, but before 2020, 2006, we were referred to as Michael Teachers College. Then because we diversify somewhat, we take out the teachers, and we say Michael College. And as Michael College, our core business was teacher certification, and we have to abide by that, what I call con conglomerate that we were in, that we call the Joint Board of Teacher Education. Because of that, we were limited in terms of the kind of external relations we could do in terms of program advancement. Because at that time, the certified teacher, that has to be done through JBTE. But outside of that, we tried to be creative and we held hands with University of the West Indies in terms of two programs, our special education program, as well as UA's BEAD program in primary education but there was some partnership there. Then there was partnership with the Police Staff College. We also had partnership with the Ministry of Education and Youth. And we, had, we were courting, or the other way around, some of the universities were courting us to have some semblance of relationship. And, some, and most of these were from US and one from England. Now, where we were courting, locally as well as overseas. But that was, as I said earlier, it was limited. Now, why do we do so? We do so as a requirement for awarding teacher certification in, in the sense of Joint Board of Teacher Education. We do so with the other partners because we were trying to be competitive and to have the edge. And we did. And we looked externally because we were promoting community outreach so as to get the micro community out into the space in order to offer its services and to use it as a mean. So get influx of students as well as faculty. And we also join hands with our partners for professional development, in other words, upskilling opportunities. Now, in those early days, how did we do it? There was no formal structure at the MICO for external relations. But the principal, the term that we use, the person in charge of the institution, his duties allowed him to be involved 
in external relations. And when such things happen, he would delegate to specific staff members, usually heads of departments. Sometimes other special arrangements were made when we were implementing special activities out of our external relation. And these activities, especially projects, these have to be managed in a very particular way. Hence, the special arrangements will have to be made internally. Now, Michael moved along the pathway of development. So we evolved. So when we got the university, the, the university college status in 2006, we have to start thinking of operating as university because our mandate is to be a full university in the shortest possible time because all the submissions have been made to the necessary body, government, of course, and we are waiting their verdict. So in the meantime, internally, we have to organize how we do things. So collaboration and partnership, critical to the life of universities. So Michael has to put its house in order. The ones which were established before 2006, we maintain them. And as we move forward, we are establishing new ones. Hence, at the micro, we are gradually building an internal culture and appetite for collaborations and partnerships. Later on, you're going to realize that I'm going to point to some gaps as a result of that. Because, yes, we are not a full university, but we are demanding from all of our community members that internally behaviors compatible with university operation. Now, as support, there was a project office established through the Micro Foundation to manage especially projects which come from external relations. And there was a sister entity that we call the School of Continuing Studies. I was the director of that entity for 15 years. That is up to 2021. I was the director. And the School of Continuing Studies had to work with Micro Foundation, especially when it comes onto projects with educational implications. And we managed to survive and to work our way through. Now, strategically, Michael has to now fully embrace what we now call institutionalization of what we do. So now in its strategic plan, the institutional strategic plan for the next five years, what we see in front of us now are some of the foci. Institutional reach and recognition. And in that we are thinking of promoting and marketing Michael, not just as a teacher education institution, but an education that you can be certified as a teacher, as well as get your degree in other related or allied areas. We are targeting internationalization of our program because we have a growing online department and I'm saying thank you to COVID-19 because that experience pushed Michael into what we were, we were I want to say, playing with before COVID. And we now fully 
establish an online section to Michael and our graduate school of education, all its program, fully online, and a, a percentage of our undergraduate programs online are blended. We are looking at staff recruitment, and we are not looking just within the borders of Jamaica. We are looking externally. We are diversifying our programs. And as I said earlier, our modes of delivery diversified. And we are looking to see now how our research and publication life at Michael can be strengthened. We have started, but we are looking for opportunities that we can strengthen those two areas. And we are looking through the lenses of collaboration and partnership. Now, how do we organize ourselves internally having such strategic foci? Then the, our, our principal is now called a president since 20, 2006. And in his office, since last academic year, the role I'm now playing in terms of the person guiding and coordinating activities pertaining to collaboration and partnership, that's a space now is structured in the office of the president. What we are doing so that what we call on our colleagues and our staff members and students to do, we are doing so through regulatory lenses. So we have developed a term of um, reference for what we call external relations that involves collaborations and partnership. And there are some policy guidelines and procedural guidelines. There are strict directives for faculties to operationalize the internationalization of, it, of their program. The Office of the President liaises and monitors the implementation of these partnerships. Now, what are the fruits we have now? Active collaborative partnerships. We, are, we have established collaborative partnership with 25 organizations, 19 of them, including 19 of them are international, rather, and some of them are from Car the Caribbean and Latin America, and we have six locals. We have signed agreements, nine signed agreements, in the form of memoranda of understanding, agreement frameworks, or letters of intent. We have four in preparation and 12 are in action negotiation. I know my time is running out. Now, how do we, what should I say now, manifest collaborative partnerships? How people know that we are involved in collaborative partnership? These are the areas. We get resource support. We share research and publication. We are involved in students exchange, staff exchange, that we are people, nowadays people are calling that mobility. We have exchange in our curriculum with respect to Michael's program being equivalent to some of our part partners, and we have articulation arrangement for students to move smoothly along that pathway in order to complete whatever they would have started. We, we have visiting partners that we share. They come, we go. There's study abroad opportunities. There's also scholarship at the doctoral level for faculty. We have been involved in many conferences, congresses, and webinars. Because we are attracting overseas students, then the need for practicum and supervision 
practicum placement, supervision of practicum, those things become critical now. So those are some of the things that we look for when we are in negotiation with any um, agreement initiative. We are also looking for support with respect to institutional assessment system because we want to strengthen that and we are active in projects. Now, these benefits are in keeping with what any lit piece of literature in the area would speak to. We have knowledge translation and acquisition, mobilization of talent in the production of global research, enrichment of curriculum with international content. We have best practices available or context relevant practices. We have international cooperation and solidarity. We share resources, and this is critical, especially funding personnel and technologies. And there is institutional recognition, the spreading of the micro um, brand. Then what are the challenges? Because we are not fully a university, sometimes there's hesitation of our in internal community to be hesitant in terms of being bold in exploiting opportunities that will come our way. Because of the transition, you know that institution suffers from resistance to change because people do not like when their comfort zone is disturbed. So we have to manage that and be very sensitive and delicate with our approaches. Then what do I call now institutional incapacity, meaning not putting in place the adequate operational structures and personnel to get this office going because so far it's a one man area with the president and support admin staff to get it going. When compared with other universities, there's an established office or section that is well resourced to deal with it. But we are learning and we're evolving. I'm seeing that my time is up. Then we are not risk takers. Teachers are very, very conservative. We like to do things the same way over and over, hence our comfort zone, but we have to disturb that. And incompatibility, sometimes that's creeps in because sometimes the partners who reach out to us do so because of our micro brand and what they come about may not be compatible with our strategic imperatives, and it's open itself if we're not careful that there can be exploitation because they are driving their self interest. Okay, so now, saying all of these now, Michael has been operating so far within the boundaries of what we are hearing from this session regarding internationalization of its product and services. So we take it as an affirmation that higher education internationalization is the pinnacle of university international, international relations. So with that said, I thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, wonderful presentations. And we're just going to uh, look at some of the questions that we have um, from our, for our panelists. And I just want our panelists to turn on their cameras at this time. And if we can, if we can just bring them all together, if the technical persons can just do that so we can see our panelists. And I'm going to
Okay, Nora seems to have been impacted by connectivity issues. So let me just intervene at this point in time just to support her. Again, as she noted, we want to commend uh, the panelists. Um, thank you, Mr. Uh, Bennett, yeah, uh, the micro. You did establish a very good um, background. Oh, you're back with us now, Nora? Yes, I'm back. Oh, Sorry okay. about oh, that. Okay, so I'll just ask PVC. Uh, Maynard, um, quickly, uh, you mentioned you you mentioned that you know there is how can we increase our brain gain and lessen our brain drain? I you mentioned that brain drain is one of the side effects of internationalization of higher education. It, it is, and one thing that um, my office have we we started to really work with is working with our regional institutions. Um, and what we've done is we've created um, internships, for example, paid internships as well with organisations such as CRIF and Caribbean Airlines uh, and a few others. So what we're doing is we're showing that the students can have the international experience, which they will have as a product of the multiple multicultural staff that we have here and also we and with regards to our partnerships because as as um many um will know there are numbers of conferences and so forth that take place but what we've started to do is to start to um, include the students and hear their voice and include them in the research so when we're doing conferences we often bring in the students so that they can give a perspective um, on matters that will affect them and also like I said the internships are proving to be um, very 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 positive and um, what it has led to often as well is for them gaining employment um, which has then um, if I say negated the uh, desire uh, to leave and, and get employment um, um, elsewhere. Um, the other side of things that I think would help, and we have really pushed towards doing this, is working and getting scholarships for those uh, students that want to continue um, down the research path, for example. So they want to continue doing a, a graduate qualification or a PhD. So um, we, I spend a lot of time with me and my team um, and we make sure that we can uh, source those scholarships, um, the international ones, um, to assist those students so that they will um, do their research but then come back into the region. So, I mean, the, there's the, the strategy um, often is prohibited by resources, as you can appreciate, um, but we try to overcome that by having us as a dedicated, uh, my team certainly, and we work on many special projects. So we're open to a lot of those. And then uh, of course we manage the relationships with industry and businesses. Um, to make sure that we can support um, those students moving forward. Um, but in areas such as teaching, for example, and nursing, it's a real challenge. Um, and I, uh, looking at that challenge, I would say that um, the only way to overcome that, I suppose, is for us to create a, an environment where we um, specifically train those individuals based on that need for the international market because it serves two purposes then of course doesn't it we may get some that will come in and stay with us or we certainly will then be able to increase our revenue from that and therefore be able to uh, finance and support the internationalization strategy i hope that answers the question in a very um compact way certainly um thank you so much for that those are strategies that can indeed work uh, I want to ask Shane, and this is coming from Professor Morris um, in the chat. He wants to know what collaboration exists where curriculum is concerned with other medical schools in the Caribbean. Well, thanks for the question. Let me off the bat put out a disclaimer that as I work on the side of accreditation, I can't exactly tell you what goes on behind the scenes in terms of the, the chat that's there. But what I can say is that the question um, has to be broken up into two parts. Now, the truth is that there are commonalities between all of these international medical schools in the Caribbean. And the commonality is that we train 
primarily, now we have diversity, but primarily we train North American students who primarily want to go back to, to practice in North America. Now, because of that, there are certain gatekeepers that are common to each of these schools, primarily, again, the NCFMEA, um, ECFMG for the graduates, if you get specific, and now the World Federation for Medical Education. So these gatekeepers sort of keep a tight watch. So in terms of curriculum for the basic sciences, there are some stipulation that, stipulations that each medical school has to abide by. So in terms of a minimum number of hours of basic science training, in terms of what constitutes the core rotations, um, in terms of the areas that, that you have to teach, in terms of comparability. So there are these things that must be in place across all the institutions. You see, the NCFMEA, and I'll try to be short, the NCFMEA is big because of the Title IV funding. And permit me to say, I hope nobody gets offended if I say Uncle Sam, is, is very concerned about the dollars that they loan. And so they want to ensure that the education that is received by their citizens is of a world-class standard whereby they can return to the U.S. to practice efficiently as a medical doctor. They should not be at a disadvantage because they didn't train in the U.S. If we go to the, to the, to the specific training part, that's the second two years in terms of the actual rotations, you will find that in one clinical site, for example, there will be students from different universities. Um, doing the rotations. And of course, they do get training there as well. So at that level, there is probably one um, teacher, if you want to call it that, which would be a doctor. And, and that person will be instructing students from various institutions. So I don't know okay. if you want to call that collaboration, but um, that's the extent um, to which it is. And I, I, I'll stop here. I am getting cues. Thank from you so much. All right. We'll, we'll be ending in about five or so minutes. So let's move along with the questions. Uh, for Michael University College, uh, you spoke about research and publications. Um, Professor Morris wants to know um, if you have a number of collaborations on that, um, international collaborations on research and publications. No. That's very few, very few. Okay. And what is happening now with the, those, who have, uh, those universities expressed interest in the negotiations with them, we are pushing that area because that, that's a strategic focus for Michael to build because you know for us to be a university, Michael University, the, un, the, the research and publication um, must be strong. Thank you so much. And I want to ask all our panelists, you can give a sentence or, or two on this. Uh, the Caribbean is known for its diverse culture and we, we, we have, we, we, we're very good when it comes on to sports and so on. Do you think that we're leveraging that enough? Just one or two sentences. Do you think we're leveraging our key points when it comes on to internationalizing a higher education in terms of attracting students? Anybody can answer. Uh, let I begin. I don't think so. Um, because um, there's no aggressive marketing plan that we use our achievements in sports so as to get international students here. We may see them, but that's not, not a result of a structured effort in recruitment. Okay, so there's room for room increasing for that. that. Mercedes from Cuba, she's asking us, um, what she says one of the key terms has been integration. How to move, how do we move to real um, integration? PVC, you want to lead on that? Thank and you. And as well. And thank you for the question. When we come to moving to real integration, I mean, the one thing, that stands out immediately when we look at the, the, the global south is getting around the language barrier. So there needs to be a concerted effort, I would say, for that integration as a global south 
to rectify that issue first and foremost. Um, when we are um, talking about integration with our Global North partners, I think that we are achieving that, but I think our reputation, we do, each of our universities here have their own reputation within their field, and, and UWE has, you know, gone ahead and taken on the, the the big dive and gone with the Times Higher Education, for example, to get their ranking acknowledged based on obviously research and the other various activities. But when it comes to that, the real um, integration um, part of that, I think the language is the biggest barrier um, that, that exists at the moment. And I, and I feel that when we are looking at our teaching particularly to help and aid that integration is when we're looking at our online programs there should be our online program should have a supportive element where students can then study i know they may have to take an exam in either english or spanish or whichever language but i think that having the actual teaching and learning materials in uh, constructed in such a way that they could feel comfortable in their mother tongue um, in the learning part of, of that may also help with, with that integration. And of course, student mobility essential um, and really push student focused issues and get those students involved in these issues. And I think that's also key for them to invest in their future colleagues and learners that are coming up behind them and um, because students listen to students at the end of the day um, and it would be really good for them to um, work together in forums I mean such as this I try to invite where possible our students to participate in all of the areas um, whether they're undergraduate or postgraduate and I've noticed that that has really encouraged the others to see them see that integration um both internationally and uh, regionally okay Diana, I'll hand it and over to you <laughs> yeah i absolutely agree with you pdc may, may not and especially with the point of the language barrier but i think we can we can conquer that you know with student uh exchange programs that we've done in the past i mean i am bilingual and i'm a product of that because I did my first degree in Cuba. So why can that be extended across the other uh, Spanish or non-English speaking Caribbean islands, you know? Um, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of space for collaborations with research. If you look at the statistics, you'd realize that within the Caribbean, within the Latin American Caribbean region, a lot of collaboration is between Latin American countries and very little between Latin American countries and Caribbean countries, English speaking Caribbean countries. So I think fora like this is a good place to start. And like I mentioned in my presentation, our, our presence in these sorts of, in these sort of fora is very little. So I think we need to hold ourselves accountable as well so that we have greater representation in fora like these where our voices are heard, our needs are met, and we can begin to answer the question and move towards real integration like Mercedes alluded to. So that's my little piece. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, and finally, if you can answer in a sentence or two, how has internationalization impacted local laws um, where these partnerships are found? Is there an impact? Um, does internationalization impact local laws? Um, I, I, that's quite difficult when you're working regionally, if I can um, interrupt and say here. It, it will have interrupted... Um, that's from Cheryl in Barbados. Sorry, I didn't mention yeah. that. It's, it's, that's a, a, a tricky one because I think that that's very country specific or island specific. There's greater integration um, in some countries. Barbados is probably a prime example where um, internationalization has had a significant effect because they have an awful lot of businesses, international businesses that will have significantly sized offices and so forth. So their laws will have um, developed shall I say, to accommodate that international element of it. Um, I think that it does happen, but it's sporadic. 
Okay, thank you so much. And thanks to all our presenters. This has been an exciting conversation and no doubt the conversation uh, will continue. And just to quickly say that we've seen where internationalization does have positive e effects on the Caribbean, improved academic quality, um, or, or students and staff being more internationally oriented. We've learned that from our presenters. Revenue generation has been um, raised from stimulated foreign direct investments. We also see that there is a potential for brain gain, but we must be careful of brain drain. Um, diversifying and enhancing the learning environment is also a key, um, a, a key one. And we see that from Grenada, where there has been significant investment in infrastructure. And there is also the potential to change the lives of international students as it helps produce graduates who are internationally knowledgeable and cross-culturally cross sensitive. Um, we also see where there is room for improvement as it pertains to assessment and quality assurance of international education. And we also see where international academic standards are bound to increase as well as research, teaching, and other services that are provided in a global context. And, and so we'll be continuing this conversation. Thank you so much. Um, we are aware that there are many challenges, um, risky and expensive startup. We heard about that, the dominance of developed countries, and of course, brain drain. Nonetheless, uh, the Caribbean is ready to meet these challenges, and we hear that, and we see that, and we hope for the best as we move forward. Dr. Black, over to you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Noda. You were under significant time pressure there. <laughs> you were raised through, but you were able to complete very well. So thank you. Our colleagues, all I want to thank you so very much for a stimulating conversation this morning. I want to, again, just acknowledge uh, Dana Lazarus McWilkin from Grenada the representing regionally the regional implementation structure for the Buenos Aires Convention as vice president. We want to acknowledge uh, PVC Maynard, excellent presentation, and we appreciate the, the points that you raise. And as Norda just highlighted, the issues related to uh, brain drain. But, but you also raised a point that has been uh, significantly uh, or significant quite important within the context of the conversations across the region that having to do with decolonization, the extent to which we look at our structures, we look at the, the, the curriculum, we look at the teaching and learning process, assessment, et cetera, but to craft something that reflects who we are within Latin America and the Caribbean. Research has been raised significantly. I want to acknowledge, uh, Mr. Bennett, what, what you shared there, th that journey, um, of, of the Michael uh, University College, a very significant institution in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, you know, I'm not just talking about Jamaica now, but certainly as a, as a leader in teacher education, um, you have represented quite well. And um, we, we note the emphasis on collaborations and partnerships. And Professor Morris, in his contributions, sought to direct onto the issue of research. And so thank you. Uh, Shane, we want to acknowledge and thank you, your work through the Grenada Medical and Dental Council. Uh, we want to acknowledge that overview you gave of medical education in the Caribbean. And certainly you, you noted very well the presence across the Eastern Caribbean, but we also note the representation in the Dominican Republic. And so thank you. Cuba is also quite strong in this area. And we acknowledge the contribution that they have made to, to the education and training of medical professions from across the Caribbean and indeed Latin America, an internationalist perspective. So these issues have been brought to the fore. We have captured some, some points in terms of the summaries that Norda uh, just presented, and we'll be sharing this. The conversation will continue as UNESCO ESL seeks to present for, for the for, for the reflection of all those who will gather in Brasilia next year, March, the thoughts of the Caribbean, the thoughts of Caribbean people concerning the future of higher education in the Caribbean. So thank you very much. Have a good day wherever you are. And we certainly hope that you will join us in future consultations. Thank you so much. Have a very good day. Thank you all. Bye-bye now.